You are listening to the Gateway Church in Spring Lake, Michigan. To learn more, visit us at thegatewaygh.com. Our theme this year has been Simple Christmas, and we know that that has been, we've been kind of fighting with the idea that is it the best time of year? Some say it is, some say it isn't, and uh, over the last few weeks I've tried to do my best to, uh, to bring a fun way to start, and I'll tell you, it's been a little disheartening. <laughs> um, I sang by myself and tried to get you to go. I even grabbed Pastor Bobby's guitar. Some of you were here for that, and uh, especially first service, that was just really tough and didn't go so well. Last week, I tried to whistle, and we tried to whistle and sing, and that would, didn't really go all that great. And, uh, and I thought, man, Pastor Bobby, it's your job to help me look good. <laughs> and he just sits there week after week, no help. And Pastor Bruce, the same. And Rachel, it's like they're just letting me die up here trying to sing this silly song. It's the most wonderful time of year. And then I thought, you know, last week, you know, my son, he's so talented. I mean, good grief. He could have said, Dad, you know, we could work on something together. But not once did he come <laughs> and say, oh, let me help you out. And Reagan was even here last week. She'll be here second service. I mean, she's got a beautiful voice. She, sh- she should have said, Dad, let's do a duet or something like that. But we didn't see that happen either. And so what I thought, well, I'm going to get out my harmonica. But I didn't practice, so we're not going to do that. <laughs> and I thought, what is the best thing we could do? Since everybody was, n- you know, just thro- let me just be on my own. I thought, you know, what about karaoke? Find the words, right? they give it to you. The music's there, and I certainly have got a decent voice. We could do this together. So without further ado, I want you to stand up and help me out here. It's like karaoke all together. We're going to sing this song, sing it out The most, oh wait, not yet. So, see, I already messed it up. It's wonderful time of the year. All right, you got to move a little bit. All right, come on, here we go. With the kids jingle belling and everyone tell, be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. The half happiest season of all. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Just be seated, just be seated. It is not the most happiest season of all. We've struggled with this and we've been challenging the premise of this song week after week and it's the last time, I promise. But we've, we've said it is not because it's complicated. It, this season is complex. It is a difficult. And we've been trying this year to do the impossible, to simplify Christmas. Two words that don't go together is simple and Christmas. And you say, well, why is it so important that we get our mind around this? We want you and your family to experience Christmas to the greatest extent, to get the fullest out of it. But the past three weeks, we've said, look, the frenzy and the finances and the family, each of those things are complex. And they, each of those things uh, fight against simple. And the way I see it, it is crunch time, isn't it? We're two days away, right? And the, it's Christmas is coming. The rubber is meeting the road, so to speak. And I just want to remind you what we've accomplished the last three weeks, and then we're going to dive into some new material. We talked about the frenzy, and we talked about the busyness, and we said we, because it's so busy, bu- so busy, <laughs> busy, busy, busy. Anybody get it? Frosty the Snowman. Come on. Don't worry. Uh, anyway, we just watch that as a family. Uh, but because it's so busy, we must protect our lives, and we've got to find time to be in the presence of God. 
And it's the presence of God that makes the difference. And it's not presence, it's the presence of God that is what we should be looking for. And when it came to finances, we challenged you. And some of you are doing it. And some of you come to me and said, man, we're, we're trying to live. We're trying not to go overboard. We said to set a budget and stick with the budget. Even if you had to return gifts that you already overspent, return them. The, it's just something we encourage you to do. And then for family, we said, look, the best gift that you could give yourself is to forgive to forgive others, forgive yourself, and uh, it's, it's so freeing, and uh, we, we've been encouraging you in, in these areas, and today we're rounding the corner, we're uh, rounding out the series, uh, it's kind of like we're, we're, if you're a baseball analogy, we've, we've crossed third base and we're heading home, uh, but because of these three previous F words, that's weird, uh, frenzy, finance, and family, the final F gets forgotten. What happens? It becomes an afterthought. It doesn't always get our greatest attention, and sometimes it's a last-minute attention that it comes. And what I'm talking about is our faith. Everyone say faith. faith. It's our faith, what we believe. And you put together faith in Christmas like the other F, Fs of Christmas. Uh, it, they don't automatically, uh, it doesn't automatically scream simple. Our faith is not always simple. In fact, there are some challenges when it comes to faith that we have to all get our minds around. For some people, it's like, well, I just don't care. I don't even have a faith. And, uh, and, and you almost dismiss it. But it, at Christmas time, it kind of gets pushed in your faith. And so it becomes complex, right? There are others that are not connected, but should be connected or thought they were connected at one time. Others have drifted away. Or maybe you're like my friend that I mentioned last week that grew up in the church and now he's really struggling. He's like, I don't know. And it's not just the Christmas story that he doesn't know about. It's faith in general and it can be complicated. And then we look at the frenzy, how it affects our faith, right? The busyness, it pulls us from the presence of God where we're supposed to be spiritual or supposed to kind of spend extra time perhaps at Christmas but it often gets missed. And then the finances that we talked about and how does that relate to our faith doesn't maybe ne necessarily directly make a tie, but let me try to do this. Uh, we get stressed out because of the finances. We might feel guilty, so we overspend. And then there's pride in the mix or contentment, and, and we're concerned about well, maybe keeping up with the Joneses, at least for our kids' sake. And then we say, well, who are we going to trust with our finances? Is it going to be the credit card company and we'll pay it off for the next six months? Or are we going to trust God that it's just okay and we can stick to a budget? And then you look at family and how that affects our faith. How many know family and faith, uh, it's, it's the most wonderful thing, but it can be complex. It can be difficult. There can be differing beliefs and, and uh, different things. You don't want to offend anyone, so maybe you don't bring it up. Are we going to pray for the meal? Are we going to read the Christmas story? All these things, right? And you don't want to be left out, so you keep quiet. Maybe you've learned your lesson. Maybe you were a little bold uh, at, at a different time in your life. And all these things are complex, and we got to wrestle with all of these things. And then you just look at faith in general. Faith in general at Christmas time, I'm confused by it sometimes. Because at, it's like the one time a year that your non believing friends all of a sudden are doing things going to church on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, or they drive by the manger scene and get out and walk around, and, or they go to midnight mass, right? And uh, these non-believers, you know, it's like, it's like even uh, non-believers are Christians at Christmas time, right? It's like weird, and they're saying Christianese types of things, joy to the world for the Lord has come. And you're thinking, do I even know you? <laughs> you know, why are you saying that? And it's complex and culturally come on faith is challenged at christmas time is there anyone here that is sick of when people on tv or in politics or whatever say happy holidays oh come on i mean if you're not mad about that you can just leave right <laughs> And then the commercialism around it, right? And we look at Christmas, and it hasn't just become another family holiday. You know, like where we know Independence Day, we celebrate that on July. July. And what do we eat? We eat hot dogs and 
hamburgers, right? And then Halloween is October 31st. That's my wife's birthday, but it's more than that. It's the day we eat too much candy, right? And then Thanksgiving, it's on the last uh, Thursday of what month? November, right? And what do we eat at Thanksgiving? Turkey. And then it's Christmas, December 25th, ready or not, two days away. And what do we eat? We eat ham. Is this what has happened to Christmas? It's just another day, another holiday. Is this what Christmas has boiled down to? And it's not simple, especially when we throw in our faith component. And so the question I want to ask today as we wrap up this series is how do we simplify and keep faith alive? How do we strip away the unnecessary stuff? How do we uh, look for the true meaning uh, and keep it at the forefront? And how do we avoid the trap of these things that we've talked about, the busyness, the finances, the family, the uh, things that attack our belief? And uh, with the Lord's help in the next few moments, uh, I pray that we will get some traction and we will leave here uh, really keeping faith alive. You know, I was thinking about it. Uh, the Christmas story is one small section of this great story found in the Word of God. And, you know, the art of storytelling is, is something that is great, but we see in Scripture the greatest story from Genesis to Revelation. We, we see, weaved throughout each of these books, we see the story of Jesus Christ, Right? And the Christmas story is a chapter in Jesus' life, and it, in, on its own, is an amazing story. Let's think about the Christmas story for a minute. And this is important. You know, we've got the Old Testament prophecy. Uh, during our huddle today, uh, Pastor Bruce was reading out of Isaiah uh, from our soap reading. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, you know, the Old Testament, there were men of God hundreds of years before Jesus was born that were prophesying, that were foretelling that a Savior was coming. I mean, you think about that. And they had the boldness to share what they felt like God had told them. And they were pro prophetic about that. And then in this Christmas story, there's angels. And, you know, we think about angels, and we, you know, last week we had the, the, the angels that were just, you know, as cute as can be, and the wings and the, the halo. But I'm telling you, angels are scary. <laughs> and the angels showing up, if an angel showed up right now, I mean, we would be all on our face. Uh, and, and most of us wouldn't even take a glimpse, right? And then there's wise men, there's a star they're following. The Christmas story is full of these beautiful pictures. And then we got the king, the enemy, right? Every good story has a threat, and uh, the king is on his, on his uh, way. He wants to make sure his throne is protected. Then we got this beautiful young couple, Mary and Joseph. They're pregnant, right? They're on a journey. There's no room for them in the end, the crisis. And then we have the birth of a Savior. I mean, it's a great, great story. Then after Jesus is born, they're on the, uh, the run for their life. They're, they're trying to uh, protect their son. And everything you need for a great story is found in this Christmas story. No matter how you slice it or cut it up or you look at it from different angles. And I would say that a great story like this, it must be told. It needs to be passed down from generation to generation because there's power in the story, isn't there? You know, I was thinking about stories in my family, and I was sharing with the, our family last night, just, you know, we, over the last few uh, weeks or a few days, my daughter's been home, we've had some friends over and just different things. The family was over yesterday kind of celebrating Christmas, and, uh, you know, there are stories that are told within families from generation to generation, things that my grandma and grandpa told my dad, and my dad has told me, and in different things. And even within our own little family, uh, the Vey family, uh, there are things that my kids will have us ask, they'll say, tell us that story again, how you met, or tell us about that dating story uh, when you were snow skiing and you left mom in the mud, and, uh, and uh, you, know, think, you know, just things like that, you know, or, you know, your best vacation, or you, you're telling about, you know, you know, the, the near tragedy that was missed. And you reminisce when you get together with family and you tell stories 
And sometimes you laugh, sometimes you cry. How many are with me? These memories, you keep them alive, right? And it's meaningful, these stories. That's why we share them over and over again. But with the Christmas story, come on, it's another level. It just is. A chapter in God's plan, the central theme of the entire Bible, Jesus and his life, ultimately giving, uh, you know, giving his life through the death and then his resurrection, the price he paid on the cross for our sins. I mean, it is an incredible story worth repeating over and over and over. But within that story, if we're talking simple Christmas, What are a couple things that we have to identify or have to address within the story? Well, there are two questions that emerge that uh, I thought that we've got to continue to remember within the Christmas story and uh, really throughout Scripture. But number one is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Of course, you know the verse. If you grew up in church, you probably memorized this at some point. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only son. You know it. And we, th- we see there in that verse that Jesus is the son of God. It's incredible. You think about that. God coming to earth. And then you go to Matthew chapter 1, and uh, we, we read this just yesterday uh, in, in our, with our family Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, it says, This all took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets, right? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel. So now God, Jesus, God's son, but he is God as well. It's God with us. And then you look at John chapter 1, verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelled among us, right? It's the idea where Jesus, he put his divinity aside. It's like, uh, you know, he limited some of who he was. And, and I've heard it described this way, that it'd be like a human being, like me or you, becoming a little tiny ant and trying to win an ant colony. That's what Jesus did. No one would choose to do that. But God, he sent his son from heaven to become little just like us, Jesus, God, fully God, fully man. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Who is God or who is Jesus? Jesus is God Almighty. And we got to remember that. And that's why this story carries so much power and so much impact. But even more so than who Jesus is, we need to wrestle with that. But what did Jesus do? What did he do? Well, in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and favor with God and man. Uh, when he was young, he was in the, found in the temple, and then as he grew, um, he found favor with those that were around him. At age 30, he kind of had his coming out party, so to speak, and uh, he's now uh, in full ministry. Uh, he he's, creates a team. He pulls disciples to himself. Right? He heals the sick, and he's raising the dead, and he's, his teaching is off the charts. Um, it was revolutionary. And then he's obedient to his father's plan to the T. He says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Right? And ultimately, he, we find that he gives his life for humanity on the cross. And it's a simple story. It's a simple idea. Jesus is God. And Jesus was born, he lived a perfect life, he died for you. That's what he did. And you think, okay, all right, that's a good story. That's the simple gospel message. But what happens when you take a story like that and then you believe in it? You put your faith in that story. And your faith rests on a story like that in what you believe. And I would submit that until your life intersects with this story, it's just a good story. But when it does intersect, it becomes the greatest story ever. And I would say that the the question shouldn't always just be, who is Jesus and what what did he do? We should change it to, who 
is Jesus to you? And what has Jesus done for you? And make it personal. Is he your Lord and Savior? He's been pursuing you ever since you took your first breath. He wants a relationship with you. He loves you. He lived for you. He died for you. And Christmas is such a great part of the story, but that was his birth narrative. But the real powerful part of his story is when he gave his life and then was, uh, was brought back from the grave, his resurrection. That's where we find the power. We see the hope of salvation. And what's awesome as well, it, the promise also is that he's coming back for us. And because of what Jesus has done for each of us, we must work hard to keep that faith alive. So how do we keep faith alive? I want to talk about that for a moment. I was thinking back in my, in my story, uh, my growing up, and I'm going back 30 to 35 years ago. I know it's a long time ago. I'm dating myself, right? I know some of you are thinking, man, you're old, and uh, yes, we are. But um, uh, anyway, I remember growing up, and we lived just a couple miles from my grandma and grandpa, and, uh, but every Christmas that we were in town, uh, when we weren't in California, because my mom's whole side of her family lived in California, but the years that we were in, in Detroit, in the Detroit area, we would spend Christmas Eve at my grandma's house. And not only was it our family, but it was my dad's brothers and sisters, or all of his sisters. He was the only boy, uh, but he had four sisters, and uh, they would all come, and all their kids would come, and we didn't go home. It was awesome. We had a sleepover every Christmas Eve, and it was a big family deal. And what was great is, and I, I get it now, what the parents were doing, um, they were trying to keep Christmas alive, but they also were trying to just keep the kids out of their hair. But uh, the assignment was, and over and over, every year that we were there, they would send us kids to the basement to work on the Christmas theatrical event of the year. And they, we would get assignments, and uh, we would work together, me and my other cousins, and there would be a Mary and a Joseph and a Wiseman and, a Wiseman and the angels, and there would be shepherds and Jesus. We never had a Jesus. We just always used a doll. And we didn't want to, you know... Uh, overemphasize anyone but uh anyway but there was always jesus played as a little doll and we would practice for hours we would think about the story and we would work on it and we'd rehearse it and then we'd reemerge out of the basement and we put on the show for our family and it was beautiful. It was really fun. And my grandma and grandpa that was one of the things that was important to them and they would set it all up. And on top of that, we would also read from Matthew chapter 1, then Luke 2, and then back to Matthew 2. That's how you should read it, right? And, uh, and we would read that. My grandma and grandpa would read that every single year. And the other thing they would do is before the presents were given, my grandma, every year, not that she didn't have enough to do, but she would bake a cake for Jesus. And we would sing with candles and everything. We'd sing happy birthday to Jesus. I look back, I think my grandma was a saint. <laughs> and uh, she just was, and I miss her. And I know some of you have family at this time of year that you miss, and I get that. And I, I miss seeing my grandma. Um, we, she passed a few years ago. But I, th I look back and I think, man, my, my family, you know, when it was my grandma, when we were there, they kept Christmas alive. Now you fast forward all these years, and it was my family. We have not lived by family until just recently. Jessica's parents moved here uh, last year. Was that two years ago? Two years ago now? And, uh, and so we didn't have family close by, and so, so there are a lot of Christmases that it was just us and then just our kids. And, and I, I, you say, how do you keep you know, Christmas alive in a situation like that. And, and I know what some of you are thinking, you know, oh, in the pastor's home, it's just got to be dynamic. I mean, <laughs> pastor probably preaches and gives an altar call. And uh, I mean, it, it, the glory falls, right? And I'll just say, honestly, we have to work at it just like the rest of you to keep faith 
alive at Christmas. It doesn't come naturally, and sometimes it's awkward. I've got the eye rolls, like, Dad, do we have to do this again, right? And now my kids are a little older, and they get it, and we, uh, we, you know, I take turns reading different things like that. But there have been times where we've kind of like skipped right through, or and we've done it, but it's like out of obligation, right? How many have ever been there? You're like, ah, what do you do? You know, maybe you're the, you know, it's the first time you're married, and now it's just you, and you're like, what do we do? Do we get out the Bible and read together? Or maybe your kids are young and. You know, it just, you know, or maybe now you're empty nester and you did something all these years and now it's your home and it's just the two and you're saying, what do we do? And it's not natural all the time to keep faith alive. Am I the only one or do you get what I'm saying? Even this week, I was working at the property, scraping some windows with Ron Varga. Hi, Ron. And uh, he's been working hard. And he says, hey, so how have you been doing this year keeping Christmas simple, and I don't even remember what I answered. I, I'm like, you know, I don't even know. Maybe I'm doing okay. I mean, life gets complicated and complex, and uh, life just gets in the way, and it's just, it, you know, it's hard to keep things simple, even if you're the pastor. I get that. And uh, later that day on Friday, um, I had a counseling appointment, and uh, and I'm and I, I'm sharing some of the. The, the stuff I'm dealing with, with in regards to just the busyness and the building and just all the things. And, and I, I shared that I was struggling with the message for this morning. And I, and I, sh- I said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep faith alive. And my counselor says, well, isn't the point to just be still and know? And when he said that, <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, he's dead on. And that never even crossed my mind. Psalm 46, 10 says to be still and know that I am God. And I was about to fly through this season, even after preaching all these great messages, right? (laughs) And it's like, man, and we know it would be good for us if we just slow down and just relax and if we're in the presence of God. But things just keep on coming. And at Christmas time, it can just slide right by. How do we keep faith alive? And then I was thinking, you know, it's not just at Christmas time that we need to keep faith alive. How do we continue to keep faith alive? And I want to just remind us, we talk about it a lot, but we talk about keeping things simple here at the church. Uh, we, We talk about living out our mission. And we give an invitation to anyone on the lakeshore that wants to join us to live out their faith faith. And every week we talk about connecting with God, right? And we do that through daily soap reading and we provide these and we're going to do that again in 2019. It's just a little scripture, two chapters a day. It keeps us a steady diet of, of, uh, of our faith and uh, being in the word of God. And it's kind of a minimum expectation. And then we talk about connecting with God on Sunday mornings, uh, how important that is to be together where the presence of God is a priority every single week. And then we talk about connecting with others, right? And we talk about uh, the small groups, and we, we've got nine great opportunities. And the expectation is that if you're connecting with us, that not only are you coming on Sunday mornings on a regular basis, but we expect that you are interested in being in a small group. And so you need to get online and look at those and sign up for one of the nine small groups, or start a new one if, so, if none of those fit, and we'd love to walk with you through that process. But just like the frenzy and the finances and the family that get in the way of, our, uh, of, of Christmas, just like when it, we're busy, we have to learn to say no, and with the finances, we have to set a budget, and we got to manage our money well, and just with, like, with our family, we can't let a bitter root get control and, uh, and wreak havoc with our family or with, our, with all those things. With our faith, we need to make it a priority. And community helps. And so we look at connecting with God, connecting with each other, but then we also say we need to connect with the world. And we do that in a lot of different ways. We want you to be involved, serving, using your gifts, and coming alongside. And ultimately, we better be reaching one more. 
We've got names of people that we've been praying for on these trees. And, and uh, each week when our staff meets together to pray this last month, we've been praying over these names and asking God to help us, each of us, to reach one more. And it's got to be a priority. And so we invite you to this simple mission, to, to live out the mission. To, we invite you to live out your faith in these three simple ways. And at the church, we have to fight to keep it simple. We have to really protect our calendar. We have to really protect. We want, if we want you to do these three things, we can't add a whole other slew of things. And with Christmas, we have to fight in a similar way to keep our faith alive. And we do that, and we ask the Lord to help us. And it's the power of a simple story that changes everything. And this is what I'd like to do, kind of as we uh, really wrap up this series. I'd like for each of us to think about the next couple days. I want to give you some action points. Not only should we be reading our soap and spending time in the presence of God ourselves, but I'm going to challenge you in the next two days when you're with family or when you're by yourself or when you're with just a couple of people to t be bold and to pull out your scripture and you start in Matthew chapter 1, in the last part of Matthew chapter 1, you move to Luke chapter 2, and you read the story there, and then you come back to Matthew chapter 2. And I want to encourage you that that is a great action step that will help you keep faith alive this Christmas. The other thing that I want to encourage you to do is not only your soap and then the, the reading of the Christmas story, I want you this week to sign up for a connect group. You're saying, man, all right, the pressure's on. Yes. Two weeks away from today, we, are, we start a whole new group of connect groups, and they are designed to help us with our faith. And then, of course, we want you to be serving serve in some way, and uh, we can make those connections. But how do we keep faith alive this week? It's in the stillness. It's in the quiet where God can meet us and really move. And so what I'd like to do before we do anything else, and even before we give a salvation call and we wrap things up, I thought it would be fun to just be still and know who God is. And so I want you to close your eyes right where you are. And we're going to try for a minute here. And I know it'll be awkward, but just to be still and just to sense the presence of God, the God Almighty. Here we go. Lord, your word says to be still and to know that you are God. Lord, this Christmas, I pray that our faith <coughs> would be energized by being in your presence and giving you precedence. Lord, I pray that it would be more than just hearing it on a Sunday morning Christmas service but Lord, that it, we'd be able to find time even in the next two days to be in your presence, to know that you are God, to keep faith alive. And Lord, I pray that your hand would be with us. Lord, that you would strengthen us for, the, for this week. And Lord, that we would sense your presence in a powerful and in a tangible way. Pray this in Jesus' name. Now with your head continue to be bowed and eyes closed this morning, I'm curious if you have found yourself here, and I certainly don't know everyone, there's some friends and family and uh, some guests that are here, 
If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. This morning, we've shared little bits and pieces of the Christmas story, the greatest story ever told, and it becomes great when your faith intersects with that story. If you're here today and you're saying, man, I have not been connected or I've struggled in my faith, or I've walked away from the Lord, or maybe you've never connected with that story, with the truth of the gospel. This morning, would you be honest with yourself and listen to what the Holy Spirit, He's been pursuing you, would you surrender your life and give your life to Jesus? If you're here this morning, you're ready to do that, first service here, I would just want you to lift up your hand, and we're going to celebrate with you. We're certainly not going to embarrass you, but who here this morning? Say, yes, that's me. I need to get my life right with Jesus. I've been walked away. I've, I've, I've done my own thing, and I'm ready to come back. Anybody at all You're saying, yep, I need to make that a priority. So I don't see any hands. I want you just now to think of the one person in your life that needs this story to come alive. And another action step would be to share, to be bold, to reach one more. Can you think of the person that you wrote a couple weeks ago? Put it on the tree. Can you think of the person at work or in your neighborhood or a family member fellow student at school that needs to know the Lord and would you ask the Holy Spirit to help you to make a connection this season Lord I'm asking Lord that you would do that in a powerful way God help us Lord to reach one more, to reach a dad or a grandma or a sibling, a neighbor. Lord, help us to reach one more. God, I pray in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Lord, we need you this season to make yourself real. And Lord, as we have worked through this series and talked about the busyness, we've talked about finances and family, and now we've wrestled in a short bit about our faith. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just capture our heart and that this year, we would honor you in our lives and in everything. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. This is what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to stand where you are. We're going to finish with a time of greeting and sharing with each other. Uh, we are ahead of schedule a little bit, and uh, which is just fine. And so there's no reason to hurry off. But this morning... Would you just turn and greet someone as the worship team, as they lead us in this final song, or reprise of a song, It's All You. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegatewaygh.com.